the war enters a new phase and why a top Republican planned to tell then-President Trump to resign. We are probably facing our last days, if not hours. The remaining Ukrainians in Mariupol refuse to surrender, as President Putin claims victory in the southern city and tests a new, long-range, nuclear-capable missile. Meanwhile, President Biden, with a renewed sense of urgency, ramps up weapons aid to Ukraine. Plus, it would be my recommendation we should resign. Shocking new audio reveals what House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy planned to tell then-President Trump after the Capitol attack. It is essential uh, that CDC have the ability to put in rules that are going to protect the traveling public. And the Justice Department appeals to have the federal mask mandate reinstated. Next. This is Washington Week. Corporate funding is provided by Consumer Cellular. Additional funding is provided by Ku and Patricia Ewan through the Ewan Foundation, committed to bridging cultural differences in our communities. Sandra and Carl DeLay Magnuson, Rose Herschel and Andy Shreves, Robert and Susan Rosenbaum, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Once again, from Washington, moderator Yamish Alcindor. Good evening and welcome to Washington Week. The Russian invasion of Ukraine is entering its third month, and on Thursday, Russian President Vladimir Putin claimed victory over the southern city of Mariupol. But Ukrainian officials are pushing back, saying their forces in the city are refusing to back down. And this week, President Zelensky had this to say. The Russian army in this war is writing itself into world history forever as the most barbaric and inhuman army in the world. And images of mass graves surfacing out of Mariupol echo the atrocities that happened in Bucha. Meanwhile, fighting in the eastern Donbass re region is intensifying. President Biden also announced an additional $800 million to help Ukraine's military. We're in a critical window now of time where that they're going to set the stage for the next phase of this war. And the United States and our allies and partners are moving as fast as possible to continue to provide Ukraine the forces that they need, the weapons they need, excuse me, the equipment they need. He also announced a new program that will allow U.S. citizens and groups to financially support Ukrainians to resettle in the U.S. Now, joining me tonight to discuss this and more, Dan Balls, chief correspondent for The Washington Post. And with me here in studio, Laura Barone Lopez, White House correspondent for Politico and David Sanger, White House and National Security Correspondent for The New York Times. Thank you all for being here. Dan, I want to come to you first. How significant is the news out of Mariupol this week, given the overall direction of the war? Well, I think it's very significant, uh, Yamish. I mean, it's significant for a variety of reasons, but I think primarily because it does really indicate, uh, in a sense, the desperation of the Ukrainian uh, military, which has fought heroically from the beginning of this war, um, and the and the sort of crushing reality of a of a Russian army which has not performed well, but nonetheless continues to put the squeeze uh, on the uh, Ukrainians. And what they have done in Mariupol uh, in the destruction of that city is symbolic uh, of of what this war has looked like and where it may be heading. It's it's moving into a phase. Uh, that could be more favorable to the Russian army simply because of the kind of terrain that they will be uh, fighting on uh, and the resources that they have and the fact that the uh, the Ukrainian military will be much farther from its uh, uh, much longer supply lines. And so uh, it, it, it comes at a very difficult time. And the atrocities that we have seen uh, that you noted in the top of this program continue to uh, be wrenching for the for the world. And the question is how much help can the United States and other allies provide the Ukrainians, and how quickly can they get it there? Well, Dan, I'm going to actually get to that last question about sort of how much aid we can provide. But first, David, I want to turn to you. What do we know about who's really in control of Mariupol, and why does President Putin think he's winning this war? Well, for Mariupol, it's clear the Russians have most of the city. There is a group of holdouts in the steel plant in tunnels underneath it. 
But they're not in a position right now to go push the Russians anywhere. So if Mariupol hasn't fallen now, it seems likely that it, it will. The really fascinating thing, though, is that, of course, Putin has retreated from his larger objective of taking the entire country and taking it, he hoped, within uh, 30 days. Now, of course, he's well past that. He's now retreated back to the original objective of the East and the South. And I think that's why you heard President Biden make the case that these next few weeks are really critical for the nature of the war. This part of the war is going to look nothing like what you saw in and around Kyiv. This is broad open spaces. As one of my colleagues put it, it is more like fighting in Kansas than fighting in New York. And that means that it does play, as Dan suggested, to the Russian advantage. But it also means that the president's got to get big artillery out that has a chance to really punch the the Russians back in place. And if he can do that, if, they, if uh, they can make that work, then the Russians would have been through two big setbacks. And of course, as you said, American intelligence thinks uh, that Putin believes he's winning this war and they've got to convince him otherwise. Uh, and, and Laura, Dan sort of teed up this question I want to ask you about how much the White House thinks that they can continue to give support an aid to Ukraine, given that they added an additional 800 million. But of course, um, David here is also explaining, talking about the big artillery. Connect those two ideas. Yeah, I mean, basically, the White House has tried to, uh, over this period of time, really um, give what it is hearing that NATO allies, as well as Zelensky, is saying that he needs. I mean, they try to very much listen to Ukraine about when do you need supplies and when do you not need them. I mean, this is, of course, going to be a conversation with Congress. But but the president is um, is definitely, they. the White House says that time and time and again, they are trying to supply, whether it's the artillery or whether it's other supplies um, at the ready uh, as soon as they can. Yeah. Um, and David, I want to come back to you because you were talking about the fact that the next four weeks um, is going to be critical and that in some ways the White House really feels like they can make inroads here. Talk a little bit about that. Well, it's all a question of how quickly they can get this equipment to the Ukrainians, whether the Ukrainians are trained in actually using it. And so we've seen Ukrainians actually taken out of Ukraine to some degree, to Poland, to Britain, to be trained on how to use uh, some NATO weaponry that they haven't seen uh, before. Um, if the Russians can't make good progress here, Yamish, they are a partly broken force at this point. They're putting back together these um, combat battalion uh, 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 groups. And in doing so, they're putting together soldiers who haven't fought with each other. They're still getting a lot of questions at home about what happened to the ship that the uh, Ukrainians managed to, to bring down, the Moscow, the uh, Moscova. And uh, that ship, uh, you know, the Russians have made the argument today they lost only one sailor and there were a number missing. We think it was probably significantly worse than that. So President Putin knows that the word is going to get around in Russia that these um, casualties that the Russians have taken are much worse than he's let on. That's, that's so interesting, um, given the fact that we saw Russia test a nuclear-capable missile this week, Dan. Um, there was also this veiled threat, of course, from President Putin. Um, and the Pentagon, though, the United States, of course, is saying that they knew about this test, they were, they were notified in time. But still, what do you make of the timing of this test, given all that's going on? I think the timing is an effort on the part of President Putin to remind people that, that uh, however badly his army has performed in Ukraine, that they are still a nuclear-powered nation, one of the handful around the world. Um, and he has, you know, he has you know, rattled sabers on this from the very beginning. Uh, and we know that people are worried about whether the Russians might use tactical nuclear weapons on the battlefield. And I think to, to do this missile test was simply a way of saying, do not forget about how mighty we are, uh, even at a time when you may think we are not as strong as we had intended to be. So I think it was mostly symbolic. I think, uh, you know, uh, in, in any other moment, uh, they would not have had to do this or needed to do this. Uh, maybe it had been a long planned test, but in the middle of the war, this was 
nothing more than simply uh, saying, don't forget about how strong we actually can be. Yeah. Um, it's 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 an interesting point just to think about sort of the reminder that this is all of this is is involving nuclear powers. I want to turn to a, a somewhat different subject to talk to you, Laura, about, and that is this new program that President Biden announced, um, saying that that it, people can sponsor in the United States, people can sponsor Ukrainians now to help them resettle here in the United States. Um, how does that program? Could, how does it relate to the other asylum programs that we see for other? Um, immigrants, and, and, and what are you hearing from your sources? Yeah, so basically it was a really big deal when the president decided uh, just about a month ago that they would be uh, taking in 100,000 Ukrainians. And this program that was announced this week, though, uh, was how they were going to do that, how they were going to expedite that process, which is the humanitarian parole program. It's something that they used uh, for Afghanistan's that were uh, for Afghanis that were also coming in. And um, it, what it does is it makes it so, as you mentioned at the top of the show, that uh, a U.S. Uh, American has to sponsor uh, people that are coming in and they have to go through background checks. But, but a lot of refugee resettlement organizations have told me that they really hope that this happens very quickly, that it gets off the ground faster. Part of this is the Biden administration's effort to rebuild the refugee program, which was gutted by the prior administration. Uh, some frustration, though, from these same organizations is that they feel as though, what about other vulnerable populations that have been trying to get into the U.S., whether it's Cameroonians, which recently did get uh, TPS status, but also, you know, people from uh, the Central Triangle. Uh, they feel as though there isn't really equity there, and there is frustration that Ukrainians uh, are being treated more favorably than others that are fleeing very dangerous homes. I've certainly heard that from Haitian um, activists that I talk to, immigration activists that are wondering, okay, well, why can't Haiti and other countries get this, um, this treatment and these programs? David, I want to come to you for another topic, which is May 9th, um, Russian Victory Day. How, what's the significance of that day? But also, what do we expect? What do we, U.S. In intelligence or, uh, sources, I should say, what do they expect um, in the coming weeks as we get closer to that date? Well, May 9th is the anniversary of when the Soviet Union prevailed over um, Nazi Germany. And so there's a lot of pressure on the Russian troops uh, before this big celebration, which always comes with a show of military might and parades and, you know, Putin will be out speaking and so forth. There's a really big effort underway to show that there was some form of victory in Ukraine, to have something to claim. Now, whether that is um, the East, the South, seems unlikely right now that they're going to be able to grab the port city of Odessa. We did hear uh, a, a mid-level Russian defense official today say that the uh, new objectives included trying to grab part of Moldova, another non-NATO state, uh, that's got territory that the Russians have long coveted. Um, it's not clear that Putin will actually make much progress between now and May 9. It is certainly clear inside the Pentagon that they want to make sure he doesn't. Well, it's certainly a date that we'll be watching and that we'll continue to rely on you to, to explain to, to our viewers. Now, we now have to turn to the surprising developments surrounding the Capitol attack. So many people in Washington, D.C. are talking about this story. New audio obtained by the authors of a soon-to-be-released book revealed that in the days after January 6th, House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy considered recommending President Trump, then-President Trump, resign. I got it. I mean, the only discussion I would have with him is that I think this will pass, and it would be my recommendation we should resign. Um, I mean, that would be my take, but I don't think he would take it, but I don't know. And I've been very clear to the president. He bears responsibilities for his words and actions. No ifs, ands, or buts. I asked him personally today, does he hold responsibility for what happened? Does he feel bad about what happened? He told me he does have some responsibility for what happened. Um, and he needs to acknowledge that. Very striking. Before the release of that audio that you just heard, McCarthy called reporting by the New York Times journalist, quote, totally false. Dan, I, I want to come to you. You're, of course, the politics. You're a veteran um, political reporter. I wonder what you make of what's going on here, especially when, you, when your paper, The Washington Post, is reporting that President Trump and McCarthy talked. 
and that Trump isn't mad for now. As an old Trump White House reporter, I have to say for now, because that's what that president's emotion seems to, seems to often be like. So how much trouble is McCarthy really in right now? I think that remains to be seen, but I think this was a terrible moment for him uh, to come out as he did uh, on Thursday and and deny in the in the in the fulsome way he denied uh, what the New York Times was reporting. And this is from the book that that Jonathan Martin and Alex Burns will publish uh, in early May. Um, that 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 denial uh, was was so strong that when the audio was played last night on MSNBC, I mean, it completely undid him. And I think it revealed him for what, what many people have criticized him for for many, many months. One, that he's been politically weak. Uh, another, that he's been hypocritical. Uh, and a third, that in a sense, he, his, his kind of you know, desire to be the next speaker if the Republicans win the, the midterm elections in November um, have prompted him to do almost everything imaginable to be, uh, you know, subservient to former President Trump. And I think it was, it was doubly revealing that after having denied and then been, you know, revealed to have been lying about the denial, that he then reached out to President Trump uh, as opposed to acknowledging, okay, yes, I did say this, but I never actually made the call or, you know, some way to... to kind of worm his way out of it. Um, but clearly, his concern is that Trump will turn on him. And if Trump turns on him, then the House conference might turn on him. And his dream of being speaker, if they win in November, would go up, up in smoke. Dan, that's why we have you on the show, because it's, it's summaries like that that makes me want to talk to you every Friday night. Um, Laura, you know, the words that Dan, that Dan just used, undid, revealed. Mm -hmm. I wonder, though, when you think about the fact that their other part of this audio is former President Trump supposedly acknowledging that he has some responsibility, responsibility for, capital, for the Capitol attack, how much weight does that have, given the fact that Trump is still in charge of the GOP, essentially, and he's continuing to lie about the 2020 election? He hasn't changed his tone at all. Yeah, what, what's so striking about this audio uh, and everything that we're hearing from the January 6th committee and everything that's come out and that, you know, uh, Jonathan Martin from The New York Times said there's going to be more tapes, so there could be very well more that is coming out but is that there appears to be no red line, whether it's a moral red line or a constitutional red line for Republicans uh, when it comes to Trump, which is that Trump is saying he bore some responsibility for January 6th to McCarthy. Uh, we also, those same reporters from the New York Times said that McConnell agreed that Trump should be impeached and potentially considered convict, voting to convict him in the Senate. McCarthy thought that he should maybe resign uh, and yet, Despite all of that, and despite the fact that he, they found his conduct unbecoming to be president, they've decided to still say that they would support him if he runs again in 2024, and that they want his support as they try to regain control of the party. Of the country, sorry. <laughs> of the party, of the country. country. <laughs> it's, 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 a, it's, it's interchangeable in some ways, but... Um... David, I mean, I would ask you an articulate question, but really weigh in here. This is sure. just the story so, that we all were talking about last night. What a Washington moment here. <laughs> OK. First of all, if you have more than two people in a room in Washington, assume there is a microphone running someplace and a tape running someplace. A good rule. OK, good rule. Second rule is, I know it's a, like a really easy thing to go do, particularly for many of the pro-Trump Republicans to say, oh, that was in the New York Times or the Washington Post or you name it. it Got to be wrong. OK, well, let's set aside for a moment that Jonathan and Alex, both colleagues of mine, are two of the finest political reporters in Washington. And if they report it, you can pretty well take it to the bank. But then to have Martin, to, to have in, in this case, um, uh, the the revelation of the tape moments after the denial, I mean, really tells you how the city works. And I, it makes you wonder what McCarthy thought he was doing, why he thought he could probably, he could get away with this. Maybe in the long run he will. Maybe no one will remember this come, you know, November and December when we're talking about who's going to be uh, running the house. Dan, will there be a political price to, play, to pay? For, for McCarthy here is is when you think about sort of the GOP and and especially in that party, not 
not a lot of people have paid prices when it comes to false information. And of course, President Trump, who, who's playing party boss and handing out endorsements, he has um, not always obviously been truthful. So is there a price to pay for McCarthy here? Well, I think there's a p price to be paid, and he's been paying it in the in the greater world. I mean, in, in the you know in the eyes of history, if you will, if, if, without trying to be too grand about that. Um, uh, Kevin McCarthy's reputation has sunk over the last 18 months or more uh, because of the way he has behaved vis-a-vis -vis, uh, former President Trump. Whether there will be a price to be paid on what he really cares about. Uh, remains to be seen. And I think, you know, as I indicated, I think to some extent or to a large extent, uh, that's in the hands of, of President Trump um, and perhaps some others in the Republican conference. But those who have gone against President Trump uh, have paid a price within the party. And, and the, you know, exhibit A of that is, is Congresswoman Liz Cheney, uh, who was on that same call uh, that uh, was uh, where McCarthy made these statements, um, and who is the vice chair of the January 6th House Committee, and who's been driven out of the leadership of the of the Republicans in the House, and and might well be defeated in November in her bid for re-election. That's the sort of internal politics uh, of House Republicans, and in that sense, Kevin McCarthy may not pay any price at all. It's striking when you think about sort of where Liz Cheney landed and where Kevin McCarthy landed um, in listening to that audio. Um, and and it, it tells you so much about sort of what was going on behind the scenes there. Um, but we have to get in one more story because this was a busy, busy full week. Um, on Monday, a federal judge overturned the federal mask mandate for air travel and other public transportation. And on Wednesday, uh, I should say, the Justice Department announced it is appealing the ruling at the urging of the CDC. So, Laura, I want to bring you in here. The White House, I've been talking to some sources, they were concerned about sort of being the mass police and being seen as the person who is telling Americans, sorry, you cannot be relieved right now. But how concerned are they about a possible precedent being set here with a federal judge weighing in on the CDC's ability to set yeah. public um, health guidelines. That's exactly it, Yamish. I mean, that is the biggest thing that the administration and CDC, uh, you know, officials, as well as former CDC scientists have told me that they are worried about the most, which is that um, what does this do to CDC's authority in the future in order to, you know, combat pandemics, in order to combat infectious diseases? I mean, the CDC was first created in order to, uh, like as a malaria control agency. So this is really at the core of its mission, which is, and the pandemic, the current pandemic we're in isn't over. There is definitely going to be another pandemic. I mean, that is a given. It, you know, it may not be right away, but that is so much a part of what the CDC has to do. And right now, this judge, um, you know, taking a piece out of their authority is, is why they're saying we need to go back in and try to make sure that it isn't in the long term damage. Yeah, and what they're weighing there when looking at sort of that appeal is what, David, you experienced. You were on a plane from mm -hmm. Boston to D.C. Um, when there were, when the policies were changing. Tell us a little bit about what you saw. Well, you know, it was kind of amusing. So we're taking off from, from Massachusetts, the bluest of blue states, going to D.C., the bluest of blue cities, right? And um, the pilot came on. Everybody knew about the court ruling and said, no matter what the confusion is about the court ruling and its meaning, it's American Airlines policy now that, you know, everybody's got to keep a mask on. So everybody kept a mask on. And about 20 minutes into the flight, they announced to us that the mask mandate has been lifted. And you saw people throwing their masks up in the air like you were at a college graduation and, you know, they were tossing the caps, right? Um, it tells you how quickly the airlines really wanted to get rid of this. And what the, the court case tells you in an odd way is little signs that the Biden administration really would like to get this off their hands, too. Because as Laura said, they want to keep the authority of the CDC, but that doesn't mean they want to keep the mask. Mm. And so the one thing they didn't do this week was ask for a stay to keep the court ruling from taking effect. Yeah. So Very in, fascinating. Yeah, so that tells you they may not really want to win. And, and Dan, we only have 10 seconds left, but you're, I want to just let you weigh in a, quickly here. How concerned is the White House and Democrats about possible backlash and confusion? Well, I think they're very worried about it. I mean, this is this has created a real dilemma for them, as David indicated. On the one hand, um, they 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 want this authority uh, for 
you know, whatever. And, and as Laura indicated also, I mean, that this authority is important in a public health uh, situation and in a public health perspective. But from a political perspective, um, they don't want to be the people who reinstall or reinstate uh, a mask mandate particularly on airplanes and public transportation. So um, this was, it had been extended until May. Uh, we don't know whether it would have come off at that point or not. Um, but, but politically, uh, they've, got a, they've got a difficult problem on their hands. Well, that's, that's going to be something that they're going to have to continue to navigate because people are so relieved as David experienced. So thank you so much to Dan, to Laura, to David for sharing uh, your reporting and coming on and joining us. And tomorrow on PBS News Weekend, anchor Jeff Bennett talks to Dr. Peter Hotez about the lifting of mask mandates and what, could, and what that could mean for the next COVID-19 surge. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Yami Shalsendor. Good night from Washington. Corporate funding for Washington Week is provided by... For 25 years, Consumer Cellular has been offering no-contract wireless plans designed to help people do more of what they like. Our U.S.-based customer service team can help find a plan that fits you. To learn more, visit ConsumerCellular.tv. Additional funding is provided by... Ku and Patricia Ewens with the Ewan Foundation, committed to bridging cultural differences in our communities. Sandra and Carl DeLay Magnuson, Rose Herschel and Andy Shreves, Robert and Susan Rosenbaum, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. You're watching PBS.